Tonight, the Republic on the Soul. I would like to present it as a yoga. As a philosophical technique. As a practice. As something that can be done. Now, it's going to be a curious route we're going to take. But essentially, what position we are going to explore tonight is a simple one, which is that Plato, through Socrates, constructs a state, city-state. And he wants to do it because it's in his interest and the purpose of the dialogue to show that that is parallel to the soul of man. Therefore, we have a simple proposition. If the city-state becomes brave, temperate, wise, just, should be applied here, one to one, we should be able to conclude. So just to make sure we're clear about this, this fundamental analogy, let's just recall that in book two, he's challenged to show that justice just in itself is worth pursuing. Without any regard to its benefits, its rewards in any way. And the opposite is the most injurious thing for the soul of man. He's given this challenge. And the challenge, as you know, is here is a just man. Curious man, because everything he does is just. He gains great rewards and benefits in every way. He gets positions of power, gets friends, acquaintances, positions of honor in the state. Even the gods are waiting for him to get into the next world so they can banquet him in his honor. There's only one slight thing about this story which is curious. He's fooled them all. He just appears that way. But he is so clever and so intelligent that not even his wife can see behind that mask is something unjust. And therefore, he has fooled them all and gained the greatest benefit by having the appearance of justice. On the other hand, there's someone else. And as far as everyone is concerned, this person, this person, is the most unjust of all men. And therefore, no rewards, no benefits of any kind, and the gods are waiting to get him when he dies because they're going to do him in and treat him accordingly. There's only one thing again with this story as it is with the other. It's only the appearance. For in reality, he is a true, truly, he is a just man. This is truly the just man. Only no one can see it. Given this kind of challenge, Socrates is asked to demonstrate that this, this man is the one that everyone would want to prefer, and this one everyone would try to avoid, if he can show that that's rational. That's the challenge. Socrates is being asked to show by pure reason, by reason alone, that everyone, everyone following the reason would rather be this man than this man. 
Now remember now, when he dies, equally well, the gods are going to do him in and give him all kinds of tortures and things like that because even the gods themselves can be fooled once in a while and this is one of the occasions. To deal with this kind of challenge, Socrates says, look here, this is so difficult, the problem, and it's difficult for this reason, he says. The soul of man is so difficult to see that in order to talk about it, he said, we need a full-scale model. So he proposes that he will, therefore, bring into an existence a state. Now, it has two features to this state. It reaches a high point of development and therefore is just. And in its decline, it becomes the most unjust state. Therefore, you see, the republic is not a just state at all. It has two aspects to it. So therefore, Socrates has to show how a state can come into existence. And in coming into existence, he has to show how it will naturally develop into a just state, with justice being the major consideration. And he has to show that through its evolution and decline, it will generate the most unjust state. The just man and the unjust man. So therefore, he has to show in a similar way how this man could become a just man, both ways and how this man could be unjust. Obviously, therefore, we need to explore the nature of the soul. Now, there are many people who read the Republic who do not see this point, which is rather curious since he spends book two so many pages on this analogy. You see, this, the Republic is not about the development of a just state or it would fail in its purpose, because if all he could show is the, me, the uh, picture of justice and why justice is to be uh, sought for, that, that wouldn't solve the problem. The problem is he has to show that it's better to be a just man simply because of the effects of justice on his own soul. That's all. That's all. Just of its effects on his own soul. And the unjust man equally well, he has to show how injustice affects the soul in such a, in such a way that no one, knowing the effect it would have, would ever choose to be unjust. Now, how does he do it? He first, curiously enough, develops what he calls a just, healthy state. And that's quite an interesting state. It's called, by Glaucon, it's a small, rustic city, very few people in it, everybody doing exactly what they should do. And Glaucon says, hey, no one would want to live in that kind of rustic state. It's a state only for pigs, so it's called the pig state. And Socrates says, oh, that's right. We don't want just a perfectly well-ordered state. We need one with high fever because we have to show these two qualities. So therefore, they abandon the early just state and so comes the development of the city-state, which we're familiar with. Now, what must he therefore do? He must show how the development of a state emerges. And therefore, what he has to show is that they are divisions or parts of the city. And each one of the parts of the city-state, he must show, have their parallels here. For each one, there must be its parallel. And once he does that, therefore, the points that he makes every, in every case about the city-state, we must pick up and apply to the soul, because that's the purpose of the dialogue, the republic. So it is an extended analogy covering 10 books. Now, remember what we said. We said we're going to try to show how this work is a yoga, a philosophical practice. Therefore, let's see if we can outline it just the way he does and use a couple of quotes here and there to make that point. Now, how does he do it? Well, 
The first thing is quite simple. We we're all familiar with it. He says, look here, to have a society, you must have uh, classes of people doing certain kinds of things. There must be rulers. There must be, uh, we might call them um, uh, guardians. those that can support and maintain and preserve the state. And then we must have the vast number of people, farmer, merchants. That's what we mean. So equally well then, if there's going to be a soul, there must be a ruling part. There must be a high-spirited part. And as farmers and merchants are concerned with supplying us with our needs, so there must be a needs, a desire, and needs part to be satisfied. I am not going to now go over the construction of the state. That's pretty well known. What I would like to now do is shift to the soul and continue the discussion on the level of the soul. Now, here we have a soul of three parts. But the question we want to ask ourselves is whether the soul of man acts in a unitary fashion or whether it parcels itself out in parts. Like when the soul of man does something, does it do it as a whole towards a particular thing in a particular way? Or does it have appropriate parts with which it then specializes its functions? Now, in order to talk about the soul, we must always keep in mind this model. All right, simple model. If you came tonight, which you did to PRS for this talk, you then must have had that object in mind. Therefore, you had to have a goal, something you sought to achieve. As a consequence, you must have thought it might be to your benefit to be here. If you thought it was to your benefit to be here, then you must have had some plan to get here. And if you had some plan to get here, then you had to command yourself to do what you had to do to achieve your goal, which was to come tonight for this talk. Whatever it is in us that does that, soul. Whatever that is that does that, soul. In the, today's world, we use the word psychology. That's the study of the soul. Psyche is soul. And these are the kinds of things we're familiar with in any textbook on psychology. Right? So therefore, we will use the more classic word soul rather than psyche or mind, because I'd rather reserve those terms for another function. So therefore, let us now put it here. You see this? Let's put another goal here. Here you can see in this very beautiful glass, glass of water with a mug and a mug, right? Why you not then seek that, especially if you have a thirst. Now, when you have a thirst, and a real thirst, would you not agree, would you want something to satisfy your thirst? But now here our question is, when we desire it, do we move with the whole part of the soul, or does, do we have parts of it? Does it function unitly, just with the desiring? Or does it move as a whole? Let me see if we can express that in this way. Does the soul function as a one, unitarily, or many? Consider, is there a part of us by which we learn? 
Is there a part of us that is high-spirited by which we then get all interested in pursuing certain goals and move ourselves with a certain kind of energy? And is there another part which moves and responds to desires and pleasures? How shall we decide that, you see? Because let me see whether we can just push this for a moment and you'll see what I mean. Is it possible that a person could be experiencing thirst for a nice period of time and therefore they are very thirsty? At such point, would you agree they're not interested in any particular kind of Coca-Cola, beer, wine, or any beverage? What, would, what they want is simply a drink just simply to satisfy their thirst. Ideally, the more they are thirsty, the more they want just, just for itself, pure water. No particular kind of drink. The more they are thirsty, the more in their mind they would feel a need for just pure water, just pure water. Wow, that's all I would need. Now, in that case, would you not agree the person then would then be in hot pursuit of that pure water. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Suppose, however, someone would say, excuse me, before you drink that, I just want to warn you about something. And suppose they warn you that that pure water isn't pure at all, but may be hazardous to your health. Is it possible then under such circumstances you might say no, even though you are driven by a desire for drink? and for pure water? Wouldn't you say to yourself, wait a minute, I better examine this. If so, there's a part of us that desires and pursues our desires and wants it satisfied, but will hold back and say no if there are substantial reasons for arguing against it. That suggests, does it not, that there's one pattern, the pursuit of this goal, and another pattern, no, don't do it. And if so, that suggests there are two patterns in the soul. Well, you might be very high-spirited and drive yourself towards that drink, but nonetheless, would you not agree, the stronger and the louder that no is, the more you hold yourself back. Well, then to that degree, we are in a curious place because to the degree that the high-spirited part of you listens to the arguments that water is dangerous to your health, it's polluted, to that degree that high-spirited part of your nature is now going to become an ally of your reasoning part. Well, if that's the case then, it looks like the high-spirited part can join with the reasoning part against desire. To the degree that the reasoning is weak, to that degree the high-spirited part may say, no way, let's get that water to the degree that you, be, or you are very clear about the fact that this water is dangerous, to that very degree it's easy for the soul then, to the high-spirited part of it, to be on the side of reason and hold to the no and, and blunt that desire for that water. Well then look here. Is it always true with this high-spirited part that sometimes it can join, and sometimes it can join with a desire, sometimes it can join with reason. Take two cases, right? Whenever you've done something wrong, or you've been wronged, think of a time when you've been wronged. Doesn't the high-spirited part of your nature become inflamed? and become interested in satisfying that wrong and have pictures in your mind of what you need to do in order to satisfy that need. And in that degree, would you not agree? High-spirited part is running rampant and it's going along with desires and it's not listening to reason. 
and you run the risk of acting out perhaps more strongly than you should, and it may not even be appropriate to the circumstance. On the other hand, if you're doing wrong and you know you've done wrong, would you not agree? You're more gentle at such occasion. If you know you've done wrong, you know you've done against reason, then you're more temperate. Because you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, the high-spirited part then is moderate and it sides more with reason. But is there some principle we might be able to do to invoke to see this better? And that's the principle I want to get to now. It's a very interesting one, and if you once put it in your mind, right, you'll have something good, and you can always use it. This is the way Socrates decides on this issue of whether the soul as a unity moves towards something or whether it responds in the particular parts that we've just outlined. He says, look here, keep this in your mind. The same thing will never do, notice he puts it in the most general way, will never do or undergo opposite, opposite things in the same part of it and towards the same thing and if we find this happening, or if we ever find this happening, we shall know it was not one thing, but more than one. That's the principle. See, that's what I used over here. Right? So, are we talking about the soul? Yes. Does the soul, right, does it ever undergo opposite things in the same part of it? Does, taking the example here, uh, is it possible that the reason would say, I have good reasons for saying no to that water? And I also have good reasons for saying yes? Well, then it doesn't know whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> but if it does know, it can't hold the opposite position in respect to what it is doing to the degree that it knows. Well, try another way, all right? The same thing will never do or undergo opposite things in the same part of it towards the same thing. Well, if that's happening, we'll know it's not one but more than one. But here we have it, don't we? One part of the soul is going towards the desire, the other part is saying no, and the other part reasoning is trying to support one or the other. And therefore, would you not agree? It can't be a one but it must be more than one. Do it again. See? How do you know you're dealing with something more than one? Well, if the same thing undergoes opposite things in the same part of it and towards the same thing, right? If we find this happening, we'll know it wasn't one thing, more than one. Let's use this now. We are going to use this now. Now, what do you need, now look here, what do you need in order to pursue this? This can be any goal, this can be any goal. We can put a variety of goals in here. <clears throat> so we can select goals in here. Would you agree, in order to pursue your goal, you're going to need a couple of qualities present? Well, you certainly have to be willing to risk whatever it takes to gain the thing that you think is most significant to you. And therefore, would you not agree what you must have is some sense of being brave or courage? Otherwise, you'd never be willing to risk for anything for your goal. Couldn't possibly do anything without that. Now, let's see whether we can get something else in here. Would you agree you also must have a certain state of mind when you pursue it? Right? Should you be reckless? Should you be reckless in your bravery? No, you can't be reckless. We, 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 we would hesitate calling it bravery. Well, you could appear courageous, but you must have a certain tempered way. Now, I'm going to call it just for the moment temperance. Right? But look here. Would you not agree you're not going to pursue that goal unless on your best judgment it makes perfectly good 
sense for you to do so. That is to say you have good reasons for regarding it as a highly valued object or goal and you want to pursue it. Therefore, there should be some knowing on your part. I'm just going to call that wisdom. By that I mean a certain kind of knowledge, by the way. Let's make sure. And you want to pursue your goal in such a way that one thing you want to be sure of, that in that pursuit of it, you don't sacrifice other things that are either equally or perhaps even more important than the goal you're pursuing. So there has to be some sense, therefore, that what you're doing has this aspect of justice. Now, these qualities must be in a state as well, going back to the three parts of the state. If we have guardians, they have to show bravery, right? I mean, otherwise there wouldn't be much soldiery if there weren't. They have to be moderate, otherwise you would have a bunch of uh, hell's angels running loose in society. Right? There must be some direction, and there must be a certain fairness, justice. And we want to explore those four not only on the level of the state, but now on the level of the soul. So let's do that. Here's where we jump in. Now. Look here. What do we mean by courage? Now I'm pulling things, all of this of course is out of Plato's Republic. It's a power. Okay, what is it? It's a power. Yes, it's an idea. But the idea is about a power. That power does something. Once it's there, it functions to preserve, right? preserve something about, now our trans, the translation I was using uses the word faith, but it's really belief. Right? Courage, therefore, is such a power that preserves through everything of right and lawful belief about what is dangerous and what is not. What is it? It's a courage. Right? Courage is a power. It does something. It preserves us through everything, right and lawful belief, right and lawful belief about what is dangerous and what is not. And only that are we going to regard as dangerous. Nothing other than what is regarded as dangerous as set down by the law givers of the state, the legislature. And therefore, when we move it into the realm of the soul, we want to know what that is, because obviously Congress doesn't convene in our souls. Temperate, we don't use that word too much. But what he calls it, he says it's a concord and harmony. Notice what it does, just what we were doing here. See, this is temperance. When? Where the better part rules the worst. It's stretched through the whole of us. As a result, the temperate part, or this high-spirited part, in joining with the ruling part of the soul, brings about a unanimous mind as to what rules. Therefore, this word itself, temperate, we could really change, because no one uses the word temperate in that way. Right. So I'm going to put a little brackets around it and then change it. In the same way, courage is not something that you're willing to risk for something higher. It's a power. So it too has a peculiar definition in the Republic. Wisdom, how best to behave to itself, right? Wisdom is good counseling. For what purpose? How best to behave to itself. If there's a part of the state 
where we can talk about rulers being wise, then they can demonstrate that wisdom by being able to show how the rulers, therefore, can deal with the whole, how to best behave towards the city as a whole, as well as other states. And it presupposes that it has a knowledge of what is to its advantage. It's only wise because it has that knowledge. Temperate. It also, see, there must be something about temperance. There must be something that tells what is the better part. That's a knowledge. Now, justice. What does he mean by justice? We are going to go back to this idea of temperate. Temperate develops a unanimous mind as to what rules and that it should rule and it should continue to rule. Look what happens with justice in the Republic. Justice is that every part, every part of it or every person is doing precisely what it should do and nothing else. Therefore, it's a rule of the self. It's a proper rule of oneself. If you know what you really should be doing, then you're, you're, you are a ruler and you are acting justly. As a consequence, you can set all in order. You become a friend to yourself. The whole soul then or the state is all in tune. You know what you've done? Therefore, you have made yourself or the city-state one out of many. Remember, unanimous mind? Justice, therefore, is the way to make a oneness out of a many. Now, the practice and what preserves this condition in the soul and works along with it, that's wisdom. See? That's the knowledge. It's the knowledge that presides over this practice. That's what wisdom is. So justice and wisdom are merged, aren't they? Justice and wisdom are merged. And equally well, would you not agree, that also brings about a unanimous mind. And therefore, the thing that's curious about this whole thing is courage. And that's our task. Let's see if I can build a mystery out of it. How can this become a learning? How can this become a practice? Well, let's take a look. If each part of the right, if each part of the soul is then functioning in its proper way, then it can rule itself. Then it can set all in its proper order, then desire is willing to be ruled by temperance, so the high-spirited part is willing to be temperate. Temperance then becomes an ally to reasoning, the high-spirited part becomes an ally to reasoning, and the desires therefore are completely consistent one with the other. But look here, we've got to build a mystery out of this. How do, you make, how do you make yourself one out of many? Well, there's a practice that preserves this condition in the soul and works along with it. Justice, uh -uh, that presupposes a wisdom, which is a knowledge that presides over this practice. So then, if that's the case, let's see now if we can build this mystery or build it into a mystery because we may not yet have it. There is a practice. Right? There is a practice that preserves the condition of the soul.
What practice is that preserves the condition of the soul? Well, it presupposes a knowledge, doesn't it? It presupposes a knowledge. It presupposes a knowledge. That knowledge presides over this practice. And it's over it. It's over this practice. Oh, we're going to call that wisdom, aren't we? What practice? It's nice to have the practice, but what's the practice? Well, it's a certain knowledge that presides over this practice. What's this practice that it presides over? Oh, each part must be doing what is proper for it and nothing else. Well, how do you determine what part is going to be doing? How do you determine the proper part for each part of the soul? What is the proper role for each part of the soul? To rule itself. How do you rule itself? Well, I know. You have to have knowledge of what is to its advantage. That's what you need. But wait a minute. How do you determine what's to your advantage? Oh, <laughs> oh, the way you can tell what's to your advantage is when you find that the mind is unanimous as to what rules. No, because that bypasses the question, doesn't it? Louder? How do you know what's to your advantage? Well, so far we haven't been told. And how to find it and reach it. Huh. Yeah. Ah, look here. The proper role is that the better part should rule. How? How? By doing what? Well, the better part should rule over the worse. Oh, by doing what? Uh, how do you bring that condition about? Uh, I don't have it yet. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see if we can do it again. We need a wisdom and that wisdom is the knowledge that presides over this practice. Well, what's this practice? Well, the practice is what preserves this condition and works along with it in the state. Well, <laughs> what practice is that that preserves this condition that works along with the state? Do we have it yet? Oh, well, we can get it here. It's a knowledge of what is to its advantage. But we don't know what's to its advantage yet, do we? The ascension to reality. The what? The ascension to reality. If you were looking for an answer. So oh, yeah, I like that answer. I'll, I'll, I like that answer. Yeah. If we knew what was dangerous, that's courage. Well, that's the other side of advantage. Oh, I see your point. You mean, let's take a look at what courage is again. It's a certain power that preserves, oh, wait a minute, we've got that idea here again. It's a practice that preserves, oh, through everything. What is dangerous and what is not? Well, then look here. What we need then is a quote. Make sure we have it. Well, here we have it. The 
The city is brave by some part of itself because it has in that part such a power as will preserve through everything the belief that whatever the lawgiver declared in their education to be dangerous, that and only that was dangerous. Hmm. Well then, look here. Let's try to put this into words then. All right. If you knew, if you knew what was dangerous, and what was not, if you knew what was dangerous, and if you had a certain power, if you had a certain power, if you could get a certain power going, and without the power you can't do it, it has such a power, just a moment, as will preserve through everything, will preserve through everything, so here's a bunch of things that the person may go through. It preserves through everything a belief. Well, what is that belief? A belief that whatever the lawgiver declared in their education to be dangerous, that and only that, it could be considered dangerous and nothing else. So wait a minute, then what do you have to have? You have to have a very clear idea of what's dangerous. Then you need this power, don't you? You need this power because you need that power because you have to preserve through everything. You need this power to preserve through everything this belief. Hey, this is where you have to cultivate a certain belief. You have to cultivate a certain belief. You have to cultivate it because you have to preserve that belief through everything, what is dangerous and what is not. Well, wait a minute. If you could do that, if you could do that, by the way, would that mean, would that mean then that you would be ruling? Would you then be ruling yourself? Well, would that mean, therefore, you have a unanimous mind as to what rules, what should rule? You're in agreement as to what rule, what should rule and what should not? If you're doing this? Oh, would you then know what's danger, what, what, is, what is to your advantage? That we don't know yet. Because all we know of, you know, if we can get a good view of what's dangerous, might we see at the same time what's to our advantage? If so, then we don't have to know two things. Well, that would be a help. If we could then discover that idea of what's dangerous, it's, well, we know one thing, it's in our education, it comes by the lawgivers. might make us uh, one out of many be able to maintain that through our, what kinds of things is it likely that we will have to go through because look here all right it will preserve through everything just what are these everythings well luckily enough on the same page we've got it what page is that? it's a 429d or in the rouse page 228 Let me read it to you. That which preserves the belief about dangers. What is dangerous and what is not, which law has engendered through education. And when I said through everything, I meant that it preserves this both in, plain, in pain and in pleasure and doesn't let it go either in desire or fear. So, well, that's easy now. We go back in here and say, 
This would be an experience of pain, pleasure, fear, right? That's what we have because that's all we need. And especially, desire, that's everything. So wait a minute then. There's a certain belief And you have to hold on to that belief through everything. You need a power in order to get that. And therefore, once you have it, you have to maintain this belief about what is dangerous through everything. What's everything? Pain, experience of pain, pleasure, fear, desire. He is not saying avoid pain and suffering. He's not saying uh, avoid pleasure. He's not saying you have to overcome your fears. He's not saying overcome your desires. He's not saying any of that. He's saying what do you have to have through all of them? You have to maintain a belief about what is dangerous and what is not. And you better get that power to do it because without it you're not going to be able to maintain it. Ah, all right. Hmm, that requires a certain effort, a certain thing you have to then, hey, practice. You have to preserve that. That will bring about a condition of the soul. That will be its proper role. That will be the better part functioning, and that's how you'll rule. But what is this belief? Well, thank goodness there's more to the book. He has quite a bit about the uh, true lawgiver. See, the lawgiver has to be someone um, won't have any trouble in working out things of uh, the sort of laws and constitutions that are needed in a, in a well-governed city or an individual. And they follow from the lawgiver's own conduct way of being. And um, interestingly enough, um, the first thing that the lawgiver must do is to dedicate to the gods temples. And the example he uses is for us nothing but for Apollo of Delphi, the greatest And the finest and the first of all enactments the lawgiver must give. And he said, what you must avoid at all expense is that we don't want any interpreters. I don't want any interpreters in this game, except the God of our fathers. And uh, he sits in the middle of the earth and interprets curious isn't it well, I want to go back to that in a minute I would now like to go to the section on what is this curious thing that is most dangerous now it has to be so clear that we'll see it when we hear it Talking about the education of the, the uh, individuals in the state or same way in the soul, I'm on page 176 at 378 e DE. Therefore, we should be especially careful what they hear first, because you want to tell them the noble of things and the best of fables. Well, here it is. You 
You have to know the shapes of the tails of the gods. You have to know the character of the god. And you have to realize the god is good in reality. Not harmful. Does no evil. Serves the good. It's the cause of well-being. Cannot produce anything evil. Good, God is good. It's not the cause of all things, but only the cause of things which are good. And other things must be described as the cause of of other things. So now I just want to move now into the statement we would like to hear, I think. Let's get it. First, he's going to state it negatively on 178. Yet he may be suffered to say that the evil men were wretched because they needed chastisement and that God did them good by punishing them. However, to call God a cause of evil to anyone, being good himself, is a falsehood to be fought tooth and nail. No one must allow that to be said in his own city if it is to be well governed. No one must hear it, whether young or older. No one must fable it, whether in verse or in prose. Such things, if spoken, are impious and dangerous for us and discordant in themselves. Therefore, the view of the God must be, he never departs from his own form, neither changes into anything other than himself, no change is allowed, nor moved by anything else. It's in a good state, remains in a good state. God is everywhere in a perfect state. This God would uh, least likely take on any transformations. No alteration. Abide simply in his own form. Would a God wish to lie or deceive in word or deed by putting a pretense before us? I don't know, says Glaucon. Don't you know? Here we go now. That what is truly a lie, if that could be said, all gods and men hate. Would a god wish to lie or deceive in word or deed by putting a pretense before us? I don't know. Don't you know? That what is truly a lie is that, if that could be said, all gods and men hate. What do you mean? This. That to be false in the most vital part of one's being and about the most vital things is what no one willingly chooses, but one fears more than anything to have falsehood there. I don't understand you even yet. Always is because you think that I'm saying something pretentious. I only mean that in the soul to be false and to be deceived and ignorant about what is real. And to have and to keep that falsehood in the soul, no one would ever attempt such a thing. All have the greatest hatred for it in such a place. calls that the true lie, the true ignorance in the soul. 
So the primary laws set down in the state are a positive view of God, the way we described it, perfect, one, changeless. And what's the worst thing that can anything can be said about? To have a, right? I mean, in the soul to be false and, and to be deceived and ignorant about what is real and to have and to keep that falsehood in the soul, no one would ever accept such a thing. So what's the worst thing? What's the most dangerous thing? What's the most dangerous thing? To have a false conception or belief about God and the nature of reality. What's the worst thing that can happen to someone? Right? But to knowingly maintain a false belief about God and the nature of reality. That's absolutely, absolutely abhorrent. No one would ever want that. Therefore, it's most dangerous in our cities for people to have a false view about God and the nature of reality. Therefore, what must they have then? The proper view of the nature of God and the nature of reality. And what do they have to have then? This is the belief, right? That's the belief they have to have. They have to have a belief about God being perfect, changeless, one, not the cause of anything other than what is good. Right? The nature of reality must be very clear in their mind. That's the belief they must have. If they have that belief in their mind, what are the things they can go through? Any? Pain, pleasure, fear. Desire, but what do you need? A certain power to maintain that. So let's try it, all right? Let's assume for the moment that there are things with each of you might say you don't like about yourselves or your neighbors. You're going to go to, let's get a good modern example of pain. You're going to go to the dentist to get a root canal job. There's no anesthesia. Consider the most interesting pleasure you can go through. Heighten it in your mind. Equally well, fear. Think of the two most terrible things you're going to confront with fear, right? Whatever it might be. Desires. What's the suggestion here? What's the order here? What must you do? And not allow any of these to dissuade you of the nature of reality or the cause of that reality being other than a good. Is that a curious yoga? That's a yoga. That's a yoga. That's a very curious kind of yoga. Where do you get the power? Now, through this, he uses terms which I want to bring to your attention for a moment. All right. He uses concord, harmony, right? and I think I may not have put it in here. I should have. Yeah, all in tune. He uses musical terms throughout this entire work. And therefore, he raises the question of how, right, how do we become musical ourselves and those that we wish to make musical. How do we do that? Because if you do that, well, then you, you experience the nature of music in a very interesting way. Harmony, concord, tune. And therefore, we have to take a look at that, and we also have to look at this curious thing called power. Now, throughout Plato's Republic, there are two studies that are very, very significant. One is music, and the other is gymnastics.
Now, through this whole work, he uses terms in a very popular way, and then he defines them for his own use. And you have to balance those two, because that's like an esoteric tradition built right within what he is doing. So now look here, don't be surprised, therefore, when we look at music and how to become musical ourselves, and it's not going to appear to be music at all. Don't worry about gymnastics. It's not going to be gymnastics at all. Right? We can be clear of that without any trouble. Let's get a couple of quotes, and then we can do it together. So first... Let's get music, which everybody knows. Four O two C, page two O one in Rouse. Then is it not true in heaven's name? that in the same way we cannot be musical ourselves, nor can those whom we say we have to educate, our guardians, until, now here's where we're going to follow it, until, how do you become musical? Become musical ourselves, or to educate others to become musical? It will have nothing to do with music. We're not going to be able to do that. Here's the condition for becoming musical until we can recognize the shape of self-control, courage, just what we're talking about, you have to recognize courage, that's what this is. You have to recognize courage, self-control, courage, generosity, and loftiness and all the things akin to these. Would you not agree if you can pull this stunt off, if you can practice this? you would therefore necessarily experience self-control. If you can go through the most extreme pleasure and pain with this idea in mind, if you're maintaining that, it should bring about an equanimity. And that would be courage, would it not? That's the definition of courage. Right. A certain generosity and loftiness Okay, how do you become musical? We can't become musical until we can recognize the shapes of self-control, courage, generosity, and loftiness, and all things akin to these, and again, they're opposites, because if you fail to do it, you'll become in contact with its opposites necessarily. Where they're dancing about everywhere, pleasure, pain, fear, and desire. And, and until we can perceive them in all the things in which they are, we must know them and their images and never disregard them, whether in little or large. But we must believe that both the image and the original belong to the same art and practice. When, hey, look here, see? Then, when both are there together, beautiful matters in the soul and the body, what agrees and, and concords with these and is of the same type, would that be the most beautiful sight? Right, yeah, the most beautiful sight. So what is, what is musical? You then have to learn to recognize all the attendant states of mind that are either attendant with these states or when you're, when you're still practicing and don't reach them, you'll become necessarily involved in their opposites. You'll be able to see them to whatever degree and to whatever image they are large or small. Now let's take a look. Would you not agree that doesn't look like music? Right? Now look at gymnastics. Everyone knows what gymnastics is, which is real nice. See, this is the training of the mind to be able to identify these states of mind and their opposites, and their images, and to the degree to which they are present, 
And that's what you would be experiencing if you go through life with this very practice. Now, what about gymnastics? Gymnastics is going to be nothing other than training the high-spirited part of our nature. And that, of course, in the reference to the soul, that's the second part of the soul. The high-spirited part. Remember we had that before? So let's read it. I'm now in the book two of the Republic, page 209. I'm at uh, 410B, Stephanus number. Yes, book three. Pardon me, did I say two? Yeah, book three. And will not the musician, notice that we call the musician, and will not the musician following these very same tracks in the pursuit of gymnastic manage, if he wishes, to need nothing of medicine unless it's absolutely necessary? Agree. Again, he will labor at the exercises themselves and their hard work with an eye to the high-spirited part of his nature. What do you got to do? You got to direct your mind to the high-spirited part of your nature when you go through all these exercises. What for? Rather than towards mere strength, He's going to awaken the high-spirited part of his nature. He's not going after strength. That's what gymnastics does. Gymnastics builds the strength of the body. That's not what he's doing. What's he doing? He's awakening the high-spirited part of its nature. Well, what will you get out of it? The high-spirited part of our nature, if, if rightly trained, it would become courage. And as he has it, then take these two natures Then to help these two natures, as it seems, I would say some God has given two arts to mankind, music and gymnastics, both for the philosophical, for the philosophic and for the high-spirited parts, not for the soul or body particularly, except by the way, but for both together, in order they may be fitted together in concord, be strained and slackened to their proper point. Then one who best mingles music and gymnastics, most proportionately applies them to the soul, would, would most rightly be called the perfect musician and master of melody. So what are you going to do? You're going to use this to awaken the high-spirited part of your nature. <coughs> That's the power. That's where it comes from. So there has to be an awakening, sometimes in other systems this goes by several important names, but you have to be in touch with a certain kind of energy, power, right, to be able to maintain this. Because otherwise, these experiences are draining. This, what does it do? It preserves through all conditions the proper way of being. Now, is that exercising the mind in a different way? Is it a yoga? Ah. 
It means then you have to cultivate the proper belief about the nature of God and the nature of reality. You then have to have a certain kind of power, right? Music emerges into, curiously enough, courage. This is courage. It all comes together, doesn't it? And therefore, there's a certain practice, and whatever preserves that in the condition of the soul, that is a certain kind of knowledge. That's wisdom. Because learning how to do this, doing this, learning how to do this, is a knowledge. You're going to learn something. You're going to learn how to do it. That's the knowledge. It's, by the way, it won't work on a multiple choice test at college. Different kind of knowledge. Right? Different kind of knowledge. It's the knowledge that comes to the willingness to do this, and you learn about it, and therefore you learn what preserves it. It brings about a certain condition of the soul that's continuous, and that's the condition for the emergence of justice and wisdom. And that's the goal for tonight. Thank you. Did you say that it was the cultivation of music and gymnastics yes. together that brings you back to her? That's, it well, it, that's what he says. Both together. Can you that's the perfect musician. Wouldn't that make a perfect musician? Someone who can identify all these states of mind and yeah. has developed the power. Okay. And what does that power do? Oh, really? Developing that power help with the high spirit. It, doves, it dovetails right back into... Then is it not true in heaven's name that in the same way we cannot be musical ourselves, nor can those whom we say we have to educate our guardians until we can recognize the shape of self-control and courage and self-control and loftiness of mind. And this is courage, being able to do this. Now, see, what's most interesting about this whole thing, you see, is, and this is the point he doesn't make. He doesn't make this. But it's certainly in a very, very interesting question, which is, all right, uh, let these be the states we just described, right? Loftiness, courage, self-control, right? If someone is doing this, would they then be able to recognize in themselves self-control? Would they be willing to go through situations that they might fear willingly? Now willingly to test whether or not they can maintain a certain state of mind? Ah. Will that bring about a certain loftiness? Should, now, here's the big part. Is it possible that what he's saying is, once you do this, you can then learn to see those qualities in someone else? Then it's training the mind to recognize states of mind, both in yourself and in others. And that training leads partly to courage? I mean, is that... How does courage, how is courage tied in with recognizing states of mind in yourself and others? Is courage a state of mind? Well, yeah, is courage a state of mind? Well, that's the thing. Well, I, is I, it? I thought courage was that holding on to the belief that holding on yes, to the an understanding right. of what's dangerous, which would be to hold a false belief about the nature of God and reality. So that, that that practice of holding on to that belief is courage. Mm -hmm. Is that a state of mind holding yes. on to that? Uh -huh. The best one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Got to know its opposite. Mm -hmm. And everything builds out of that, doesn't it? Everything builds out of courage. Thank you. It doesn't build out of wisdom. It builds out of courage. Well, you know. Wisdom is necessary in order to, to practice this, though, correct? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, no, because, you see, uh, wisdom is the knowledge. You pick up a knowledge of that practice and what preserves it. Wouldn't you want to know, hey, I was able to do it through pleasure and pain, a little bit of fear, but every once in a while with desire, I'm not able to do it. Uh, 
you'd say, wow, let's talk about it, right? Is it possible then that uh, a person might want to know what blocks them in preserving that, that state of mind or that belief through all of these different kinds of experiences? Sure. I'll tell you what we do. Uh, the noetic um, sciences in uh, Sausalito are interested in a study, and the study is very interesting, and that is that we're going to test out this very theory of music, and we're looking for volunteers. So in order to be part of the study, you'll have to identify this, the uh, particular things that you find painful, that you find pleasurable, that you fear and desire, and then we're going to test you to make sure that you have a proper belief about the nature of God and nature of reality. And then we're going to see whether or not you can then maintain that belief with a certain kind of power, and whether or not that makes any transformation of either you or the experiences you have. This is, you want to volunteer for that study? That's philosophy. Say, this is philosophy. Right. Now, from it, would you not agree, you should be able to then learn how to learn directly how to make all these distinctions, since you'll be experiencing them. And you should then be able to see the difference between them and their images and their opposites to whatever agree they appear. Yes? Um, let's say a masochist. Yeah. And I still have the um, mm -hmm. belief about the nature of God and reality mm -hmm. and my reality is being a masochist yes oh yeah is, is this the type of person where in order to achieve my reality i will have the justice even though everybody else is going to think that i am unjust no we would tell your masochist we would say you certainly enjoy getting into fearful situations and you seem to enjoy them, and you're able to maintain a certain equanimity of mind as you go through them. By the way, uh, we're not interested in that this week. From now on, will you just explore states uh, that you would call most pleasurable? No more the negative states where you may experience pain and suffering. Well, so we we pain. I'm experiencing pleasure. Yeah. Okay. But then we would want them to experience pleasure independent of suffering, wouldn't we? But I'm not experiencing the suffering. You are seeing me being burnt. I'm oh. experiencing pleasure. Yes. You yes. Know, there's an old joke, yes. hit me, hit me, I'm a masochist. And the answer is, no, I'm a sadist. Yes, yes, quite true. Let me see if I can say it again, all right? Uh, would you agree there are a certain range of experiences that that person may desire and find pleasurable? which are not attendant with any kind of heightened state that brings about any fear or, or pain. Would this person then, the masochist, avoid those in preference for the other, where there is pain and there is fear, and confront those and gain his pleasure from those? Do both. We want him to do both. And we would bring him in and we would say, sir, you're doing very well with one class. Why aren't you spending equal time in the other? And we'd also want to know whether why he go, if he goes through the masochistic experiences with this belief about the nature of reality. Isn't, isn't Javad, isn't the idea that you would be holding a false belief about the nature of reality if you were to say the nature of reality is masochistic? Nature of my reality is. But that's, it, that's not what, what we're interested in here. I don't think we're interested in your reality, your quote unquote smaller reality. We're interested in, in okay. God and yeah. See, Ultimate. what Ultimate. you'd be doing, what you'd be doing is you'd say, would you not, sir? Would you please make sure that we agree as what you're going to keep on your mind when you go through this experience? And if you have some private belief, that's very interesting. But you're not part of our study, right? That's another way of doing the same thing. And I think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, if we could elicit from him why he's gaining pleasure out of pain. And it may be because he feels guilty about something in the past or something of that nature. Right? We would say, sir, that's not the belief that we're interested in you maintaining through this kind of experience. Yeah. Is the word belief in the Greek the same as the divided lines belief? That section of the divided line that has to do with opinion? 
Well, in the uh, very likely. <coughs> Pistis, yeah. Yeah. Not all beliefs, by the way, are, can, are uh, negative. Yeah. Do you want me to check? I can find them. No, I, I'm just... Okay. Check later. So you don't have to have understanding to have bravery then? You can't... Um, just a right opinion. This is the beginning. This is the opening step of the yoga. This is where it starts. Mm -hmm. right. In music. That's right. Okay. It starts here. And then you go into gymnastics. Now you're adding to it high-spirited element. Right? Then you're being asked, you're right, is this understanding to get this idea from courage? Now let's move to courage. Right. Right. You'd have to have a unified view of the nature of God as we described a moment ago, would we not? Mm -hmm. All the pieces would have to fit about the nature of God. Okay. And that would have to be consistent with the nature of what is real or reality. Yeah, that sounds like then understanding. That, then we're going into understanding, are we not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So that so belief is sort of misleading, isn't it? I mean if you understand it, it should be you have this understanding that's a, a power. Why? Well, it doesn't pre preclude it. It presupposes it, unless we're talking about different things. Would you, didn't you agree that to have this would require an understanding of how to bring all of the, identify all of these things and bring them together into a unity? Right. Yeah. So yeah. To yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know that these are true. These are beliefs about the nature of God and the nature of reality. Agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But to bring together this idea, you have to use understanding, do you not? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then to know what preserves this understanding through all of these experiences, to know that, you would then have to identify other things, would you not? Beyond this, that's what he's calling wisdom. Want to go one more step? We'll go, we'll go one more step? Um, I don't know if I got the last one. I, I know I didn't get the last one. Two. Can you? Well, I'm on the idea here of preserving. If you're able to do this, you not only want the practice, but you'd want to preserve that, would you not? The activity, you want to preserve it? Yeah. He calls that a kind of knowledge. That's a kind of knowledge that you gain through the experience. Now, I want to use that in a way. Right. Would you agree then, if you're going to be doing that, you are going to awaken you're going to awaken the high-spirited part, are you not? Right. You are then going to be seeing a ruling function, will you not? And you would then have to be then in controlling or influencing the realm of desire, would you not? Mm -hmm. All right. Would you not then have to deal with whether or not the soul is one or many? Mm -hmm. Would you then need a couple of principles to guide you into pulling this together? Could you then talk about it in relationship to the state? Could you then communicate this? Watch them. Is it, see, what you have, as it were, is the core. Now, to communicate this to someone else with analogies, which is what the Republic is, this is the core knowledge. Now, to communicate this to you and I, would you not agree he uses a Republic? He builds analogies, and he builds models, and he builds divided line, so that, therefore, we can share it, can we not, on the basis of understanding? That's what's that's understanding, isn't it? That's the other part of philosophy. So to communicate this in a systematic way where you're trying to preserve these distinctions and be fair with each one of them, that takes development of understanding, those analogies, which is what we started with. I agree. And some principles to guide you, such as the ones that we were playing with. What's that? Especially this one, to know whether or not you can make the analogy in the first place, the conditions for making analogy. 
in order to say whether or not the parts of the soul are really our parts or whether the soul works as a unity. Because if the soul works as a unity, you couldn't make all these points. So therefore, would you agree to communicate what you see to someone else in a systematic way is another part of philosophy. But the core, the practice, is this. But you start from the practice, and then it's the opposite way that he's normally been doing. Reach philosophy at the end rather than the yeah. you start with the yoga, yeah. Yeah. and eventually the outcome yeah. of the yoga is yeah. the philosophy. Yeah, this is a yoga. But if you want to communicate it to others and make it into a coherent system, then you have to break out of just being a spiritual practice and use the mind to communicate and to nail down all of these distinctions in a very fine way. Yeah. I was wondering if, if this is correct. Hmm, good. With uh, respect to Proclus's elements of theology, I saw you once say that something, if you take something, it can. Uh, with respect to its communication, it can be three things. It can be deficient, full, or overflowing. And then you said one part of philosophy was the practice, the other part of the practice was the communication of it. Is the practice is to being full as the communication is to the overfilling? Mm. The overfilling or overflowing, I think, uh, is another way of putting it. Um, maybe if you stretch it, you might, it might be possible. Uh, in communicating, it's, it's, a, it's a procession. Uh, some processions are overflowing, right? Um, In Proclus, he makes a distinction between procession, declension, as you're probably familiar with when he talks about the soul. Um, um, a declension is when the soul, if, he has the question of whether soul as a cosmic thing, you know, what the, how the soul then can generate, as it were, particular souls. And he talks about that as uh, a kind of overflowing. He talks about it as a kind of overflowing, but he talks about it as a declension because it's a diminutive form, smaller form, of the cosmic soul. And therefore, that follows the idea of a declension, right? Par parting, where parts of itself emerge. Um, Uh, if you want to go to, uh, well, that's one third of your question. You started also with satisfying, did you not? Was it um, self-sufficient? Is what he would call it. That the soul is self-sufficient. Um, Itself, this is saying soul is self-sufficient in the sense that you don't need anything from other than what you possess to achieve your goal. In that sense, it's self-sufficient. What's the lawgiver in the soul? Is well, um, see, uh, the lawgiver... The lawgiver in the soul would have to, is not in the soul, right? You'd, you'd have to get this somewhere. And that's why he talks about the education of the soul. Uh, no, this is not in the soul. That's part of philosophy or your but culture. What is the top section? Is, is it in the soul? The ruling function. The well, ruling function. The ruling function. Reason. Not Reason it's, the it's not the lawgiver. The ruling function is like the bottom part of the meaning analogy. To well, um, the ruling function is what you what you do with what you have, how you then uh, like the use your Last knowledge. week you had the five. Oh yes. Circles, and I'm saying that so. Yeah, or the circles. Yeah. Right. So could you have the lawgiver? 
to the ruling section uh, of the soul have that have me in uh, uh, the only way the ruler is the same as the lawgiver would be if the individual confirmed all of this in their experience. Then they would be the lawgiver. But this is the education of the soul and therefore it assumes in the beginning that you don't have that, which is why you have to believe it. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. So it might, it's confirmable, but... Uh, are you saying that... Uh Yeah, as you yes, as you heard the description of music, would you agree it didn't sound like learning scales or playing any instrument? Well, looking at, uh, for example, a, a, a text on uh, martial arts. Uh, yeah. Inner, in the martial arts, there's the outer martial arts and there's the inner martial yeah. arts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're considered to be complementary. So. Well, uh, I mean, yes. Considered a higher. Oh yes. Sometimes. Oh yes. Yes, you might be able to do that, except for one word in this description. He's saying you're not going to become musical yourself or getting others musical until. So that's the condition for it. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking then that the condition for it is something the inner working, yes, I I, I think you're right. If we agree on that, yeah, yeah. 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 But that's certainly not the outer form of music or the outer form of it martial would, arts. It would the outer form. Since I don't, I'm not sure about that. Okay. I imagine that there can, I, I don't think, it, no, no, I, I don't think so. Well, I'm not sure about that. Let me, let me make sure. Um, we're asking whether or not twins would be studying music the way in which Plato describes, and one would study it this way and the other would not, but would study it traditionally. Uh, and whether or not they had to master the same external form of music, the same external form of music, whether they would be different musicians as a consequence of both the inner and the outer as we're now expressing it. Um, um, well, uh, it may be that um, in mastering music, they may have to go through a certain kind of discipline or pain, it, as discipline sometimes is an anguish to go through it and to practice monotonous things or certain things, and to keep that state of mind going through the whole as well as not to be too swayed by the pleasure. Uh, very likely, yeah, okay, yeah, in that sense, yeah, I go along with it, yeah, that's right. Okay, I had to re reason my way through that. But this music could be any music. In mastering, that's let's right. say mathematics, you're going through exactly the same type of things or any, it, well, with mathematics, see, this is the beginning. Now, there is a higher, much more higher education of the soul once we get into the formal training of the philosopher king. This is the precondition for him. Then we have to go into arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, harmony, and dialectic. But this is the way to get into it. This is the precondition for becoming the philosopher, uh, the training of the philosopher king. Did she occur while he's growing up? Yes. Yes. This is the, the early yogic practice, as it were. And the more, the more developed form, which then becomes... See, uh, I'm glad you raised that point, you see, because uh, 
One of the most interesting things in all the Platonic literature, and a persistent problem for many people, is why does he have as a training in arithmetic the question, what, after all, is the nature of the one? But you see, what he's doing through this is becoming a unanimous mind. Right? He's making a one out of many. He is becoming a one. And therefore, when he gets into arithmetic, the major question that he's going to explore is what, after all, is the nature of the one? Well, he's becoming a one. Therefore, he's going to have to put into words and express what it is about the oneness that he has become and to be able to explore that in terms of all of the disciplines that he describes within the field of arithmetic and then to go on to geometry and astronomy and harmony. Yeah. That's good. So that's a henad, right? Oneness? A state of oneness? Yes, that is literally mm -hmm. a oneness. And a oneness is another word for henad. So yeah. that would be a, uh, an enlightenment experience. Um, what it refers to as a state of mind is an enlightenment experience. Mm -hmm. To raise the question and exploring it would be to put it into words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way to go up and down those henads. Yeah, well, see, this is a training of the one. Wanting, wanting. This is a wanting. So therefore, in the seventh book, when he gets into arithmetic, he says, hey, after all, what is the nature of the one? He says, well, I've become a one. I became a unanimous in this mind. I become one out of many. That's the whole quest of justice. Mm -hmm. Now he can then reflect upon it in terms of a one. What, did, what was the last thing that you, you said to him? I didn't quite catch that. You said, Henad is a oneness. A oneness the word Henad, the word Henad and then is a oneness. State of mind is an experience enlightenment? Or what yes, was that part? Henad is also, it's an it's a, uh, idea, a concept, which means oneness, and you can talk about it. It also reflects in terms of the psychology of man's possible evolution, a enlightened state. Because this is an enlightened state, isn't it? But that wasn't unanimous mind, you're no longer broken into parts, there's a unity, it's become a oneness. Did you say that you could experience a state of mind? Yeah, yeah, I hope so, yeah. That was a joke. So you can't experience a state of mind? I tell jokes sometimes, I have to chuckle myself. <laughs> Go ahead. So you can't experience a state of mind? Yes, this is all states of mind. Oh, indeed, indeed. Yes, you see, why? What I'm confused so, about is, is that I... So it's a practice, and you have to preserve it, and it's a condition. Yeah. What I'm confused about is, like, Plato achieved a state of mind by writing the Republic. Someone, uh, uh, someone can achieve the same state of mind by memorizing, maybe rewriting the Republic also. Uh, yes, it would be a different state of mind. It would be a state of mind generated out of memorizing. You can memorize what we just said tonight. That wouldn't be the same thing as doing it, would it? Okay. What, what, pardon me, would it? No. No, okay. Say two people do the exact same thing, they would achieve the exact same state of mind, right? Uh, given, given all kinds of other factors possible. Okay. But people come from different backgrounds, and therefore there's a question about about that, but yes, loosely yes. So they could do it totally separate of time? You mean at different times and places? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's quite true. So then what I'm trying to understand is, isn't a state of mind something that has no beginning or end? I mean, it No, it depends certain states of mind. The experience one encounters has no beginning or end. That's different, yes. Okay, so... I'm An example of that, no, no, you're not and the experience described as beauty or the perfection of beauty in the symposium, it has no beginning or end. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that a state of mind? That's quite true. That's quite true. So then... That's why I was offering it. A state of mind. Huh? A state of mind. Yeah. That has no beginning or end. Mm -hmm. So then, how is it experienced? Pardon me. How is it? You don't mean how. No, do I don't you? mean how. You how don't is mean it how. Experience? I mean, with both feet, I would the, say. The state of mind. <laughs> what did you say? Go ahead. 
what I'm really trying to get down is the relationship between the state of mind and the experience of it. I like didn't if know the state that of mind difference. has no beginning or end, and an experience has a beginning, middle, and end. Pardon me, you're talking about different things. So see if you can clarify it in your mind. Yeah. Um, what I tried to ask was what you originally said to him. That was what brought, brought up the idea of my Well, mind. I think that's pretty far down the road, and I think you moved a bit from there. Um, you can talk about, see, a state of mind. That's what you're talking about. Right? That's a state of mind. It's some, and you can talk about what it is that it is encountered. What is it that is encountered in a state of mind? Right. The state of mind doesn't have, right? you can't say the state of mind has no beginning and end since you can go into it and out of it. That doesn't mean that what you've encountered doesn't have those boundaries. Okay. It can be without those boundaries, such as beauty itself. Okay, right. okay good. That, that, good. that was yeah. my question. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs>